What's up you guys? I'm glad that YouTube has led you to my lead talk. Today I'm going to tell you what lead is, why it is toxic, and its uses throughout history. Let's get started! <laughs> It's a metal. But let's go a bit deeper than that. Lead is number 82 on the periodic table, which in case you didn't pay attention in chemistry class, that means it has 82 protons. This makes it denser than a lot of the normal metals you run into on a daily basis. It is almost five times more dense than aluminum, and is more dense than iron, copper, zinc, and silver. It is, however, less dense than gold and tungsten, but those two are expensive, which is why they are less common as fishing weights. The four isotopes of lead that are found in nature are 204, 206, 207, and 208. Those are their mass numbers, which come from adding up the number of protons and the number of neutrons in the nucleus of the atom. Lead 208 is actually believed to be the heaviest completely stable nucleus. It used to be believed that bismuth 209 was the heaviest stable nucleus, till it was discovered to decay in 2003. I have no proof of this, but I think it is possible that it did not decay prior to the year 2003. I think it's possible that the structure of the universe was damaged that year when three of the worst movies ever made were released in that one year. The movies in question being Gigli, from Justin and Kelly, and the movie Quigley, where Gary Busey plays a Pomeranian. Lead is a comparatively weak metal. It scores a 1.5 on the Mohs scale, which measures how hard it is to scratch a material. This means that you can scratch it with things like your fingernail, dry ice, or many kinds of wood. Lead also has a pretty low melting point, at just 327.5 Celsius or 621.5 Fahrenheit, which played a role in it being one of the first metals used by humanity. It was easy to smelt and cast with just a wood fire, which burns at around 900 Fahrenheit or 482 Celsius. It is also a very corrosion-resistant material, which made it very popular for things like roofing. Lead also does not have a natural resonance frequency, which makes it a popular material for the pipes on pipe organs. Lead poisoning can affect your body in a number of ways, but they're all tied to one simple fact. Lead has a plus two charge. Again, a little chemistry refresher. Atoms all have electrons surrounding them. Some atoms would like more electrons, and some atoms would like less. So lead has two more electrons than it wants, so it is looking for someone that is short two electrons. When lead does find someone that is short two electrons, they link together and form a bond. This is important because there are some other elements that also have a plus two charge, as well as a similar orbit distance for their electrons. These are calcium and zinc. Even if you do not know a lot about nutrition, you can probably guess that calcium and zinc are important for your body if you've ever walked down the vitamin aisle. Both are used in the building of a lot of different proteins in your body. Lead can get in the way when building the proteins and change how the protein functions. Although lead is close enough to zinc and calcium to replace them physically, it does not react the same way. For instance, when calcium gets cupped by lead in the production of synaptotagmin-1, a protein that operates in your brain, the lead takes less energy to release from the protein than the calcium, causing the protein to do its job randomly instead of a steady pace that calcium releases it in. Lead poisoning can easily become a long-term issue due to its ability to stay in a person's fat and bones. An interesting physical sign that some people have with lead poisoning is called Burton's line. The bacteria that live in your mouth can create sulfur, and that sulfur can react with the lead in someone's system to create a thin line of lead sulfide lining the area where the gums meet the teeth. Lead poisoning can affect most parts of your body. It has been found to be a risk factor in hearing loss, blindness, diabetes, high blood pressure, learning disabilities, low sperm count, and much, much more. One of the more studied aspects of lead poisoning has been its neurological effects. Numerous theories have been put forward about the effects of lead on crime and the U.S. crime rates rose almost continuously till it peaked in the 80s. Lead has its worst effects when children are exposed to it, when it can greatly change the formation of their brain. These changes can affect a person for life, and often leads to things like increased aggression, anxiety, mood swings, depression, and even schizophrenia. Lead paint was banned in the U.S. for use in homes in 1978, and the phase-out of leaded gas in cars was also started in the late 70s. Here is a lovely chart that shows what percentage of deaths were homicides by year. In the 1950s, this number was usually around 0.5%, and in the 21st century, it has been bouncing around between 0.6% and 0.8%. But from 1973 to 1995, it was over 1% for all but a couple of years. Those couple of years were just under 1%, and it peaked in 1991 at 1.21%. I use the US for this example, but many countries have similar graphs, maybe with some different windows due to when their laws were enacted. There are some other factors that may have played into this, but lead was more than likely a large part of it. An added layer to this is that in many places, the poorer side of town is correlated to the prevailing wind direction. Here are three maps. The orange and red one shows manufacturing job density in London, with the dark red being the densest. The grayscale maps shows lead concentrations in the soil in London, with the darker areas having more lead. And the blue and purple one shows how well students in different parts of London did on tests, with dark purple being the lowest scoring. The prevailing wind in London comes from the southwest and goes to the northeast. As you can see, many of the worst performing schools are on the northeast of the manufacturing areas. The few purple outliers would have been northeast of two major lead emitters just a few decades ago. The tandem works in Merton that made lead products such as solder, 
and a bit more east and northeast was the Battersea Power Station. Battersea was an enormous coal power plant and coal ash is a major source of lead. Similar comparisons can be made in other places, especially if you add in historical manufacturing, as many of the dirtier kinds of manufacturing have been moved out of cities due to regulations starting in the latter 20th century. In many places, including London, war may have also added to the amount of heavy metals in the soil near industrial areas. Industrial areas are often among the first places in a city to be bombed or shelled in a war. It has been found that many inner city areas have unsafe levels of lead in the ground. These parts of town are often where the most violent crime happens and have the lowest test scores. Oftentimes, leaders try to blame things like this on any a number of things, including the color of resident skin or heritage, even if they do so with some replacement words. The actual issue is the poor material conditions and quite possibly the fact that the ground they walk on is trying to kill them. In the description below, I have linked a site that lets you look at the Superfund sites near you if you are in the US. These are places that the EPA considers contaminated and are trying to clean up or at least keep people away from. Not all of them are due to lead, but a lot of them are. You can use it to see if there is any major contamination areas near you. I could not find a site for other countries that works the same way, but I have included an agricultural study of heavy metals in European soil that has a good map of the most affected provinces across Europe. Going forward, I'm going to start having an additional reading section in the description for anything I find during research that I think you guys might find interesting. <laughs> As I mentioned before, lead was one of the first metals to be used by humans. This is one of the oldest known lead objects made by humans. It was found in a cave in Israel, and according to radiocarbon dating on the wooden handle, it was made in around 5000 BC. We're not sure what it is though. The paper I read proposed that it could have been a ceremonial mace or a spindle. It also kind of looks like an early prototype of the PlayStation Move. There are some even earlier man-made items that used lead as pigment, including some cave paintings and a statue in Turkey. Paints and glazes have been one of the main uses for lead from the dawn of civilization till today. The terracotta army in China that you have probably seen before has lead residue from the paint that was used on the soldiers. Many of the classic white Greek statues that you know would have also been painted with lead. But it fell off. Lead actually has the ability to make paint more durable and dry faster, and depending on what it is bonded with, it can make yellow, red, or white pigment. To this day, there are still oil painters that swear by lead white due to it being a bit warmer of a color than the titanium white that is more common in most paints. Much of the lead production in early antiquity was actually kind of incidental. One of the main ores for lead is called galena, and it also contains silver. People tend to prefer silver to lead because it is not ugly, weak, and toxic. Shocking, I know. The Egyptians and Greeks had a few uses for it, including weights for fishnets, coins, and makeup. Fishing weights are obviously one of the uses that has continued into modern day. In recent years, many places have either banned lead fishing weights, also known as sinkers, or are in the process of banning it. You might think that the concern would be having lead leach into the water, especially in places where the fishing spot is also a water source for people. But from what I have seen, most of the bills to ban lead sinkers don't seem to focus on that. The main issue seems to be birds. Birds, including waterfowl, look for small stones known as grit to keep in their gizzard. The gizzard is part of their digestive system, and its job is to use the grit they swallow to grind their food so it digests better. Apparently, it is not uncommon for waterfowl, like ducks and geese, to find sinkers that have fallen off people's lines and swallow it to be grit. The sinker then leeches lead into the bird and can kill it. It was also used for a variety of traditional medicines in China, including as a contraceptive which would technically work, I guess, but the side effect, warning, would look like the paperback version of The Stand. However, no one loved lead like the Romans. They used it for everything, from ammo for their slings to the pipes in their famous plumbing systems. In fact, the Latin name for lead is plumbum, hence the chemical symbol PB. Someone who worked with lead would be called a plumarius, which over time evolved into plumber. The Romans had their own really stupid way to use lead, though. During the fermentation of grapes, a chemical called acidic acid is produced. This is also the key ingredient in vinegar. When acidic acid and lead come in contact, they make lead acetate, also known as sugar of lead. So the Romans would make wines and grape syrups in lead pots to make the resulting product sweeter. Lead acetate still causes lead poisoning though. Although we aren't actually that much smarter because lead acetate was used in hair dye till 2004 in Europe and 2022 in the US. In the Middle Ages, lead began to be used for roofing as well as creating stained glass. When you look at a stained glass window, the lines that separate the colors of glass are called came and are often made of lead. It is still used in stained glass regularly because it is not a huge issue as long as you resist the urge to tongue down Jesus. The crazy thing is that at least some people throughout history knew that lead was toxic. In 370 BC, the Greek physician Hippocrates noticed stomach issues in metal workers. In 14 BC, the Roman architect Vitruvius talked about it in his book De Architectura that he thought the lead pipes were poisoning the water. Around that same time, another Greek physician named Dioscorides 
wrote about lead causing cognitive issues and paralysis. We have reports of lead being used as an intentional poison as far back as the 1600s, but at the same time, people were still making plates and pots out of lead. Benjamin Franklin wrote about the dangers of lead as well. Lead use fell off greatly after the fall of the Roman Empire, but interest was renewed with the invention of the printing press. Due to lead being cheap and easy to work with, it became a popular material for the blocks used in the printing press. Benjamin Franklin, who worked around printing presses for almost his whole life, noted that people that worked with the lead would end up with muscle control issues. He also spoke about people drinking rainwater off roofs covered in soot from smelters probably wasn't good. In regards to this, he said, You will observe with concern how a long, useful truth may be known and exist before it is generally received and practiced on. So let's move on to how the U.S. became the largest consumer of lead in history. Things that spur the most innovation in this world are sex and war. So it's unsurprising what one of the first uses for lead to get industrialized was. If you ever watched the movie The Patriot, you might remember the scenes where Mel Gibson's character melts his son's lead toy soldiers to make musket balls. Aside from the toy soldier part, this was a very common way of making a musket ball at that time. You would just melt some lead and pour it into a mold. Till 1782 when a plumber in Bristol named William Watts invented a much faster way of making musket balls and shot. He created the unimaginatively named Shot Tower. The way these work is the Shot Tower itself is just a tall, mostly hollow tube that was usually made of brick. At the top of the tower, some lead would be heated up to melting point and then poured onto a sieve that was over the hole. The sieve would split the lead into droplets around the desired size, and as they fall, the air resistance would make them round and cool, so that the lead would harden before it hit a basin of water on the ground. They would then take them out of the water and inspect them, and anything that wasn't good enough went back up to get melted again. Also, the larger the shot you wish to make, the taller the tower needs to be so the balls will harden. Because this process was pretty easy and produced a product that everyone wanted, there are tons of unused shot towers all over the world. My favorite that I saw looking into this is Coop's Shot Tower in Melbourne. This tower has a mall built around it, where the tower is the focal point of the traditional Australian Thunderdome. Over time, the shot towers became less useful. Now a shot is usually just made by stamping lead into a ball or by squirting it into a liquid and letting it roll down an incline while under liquid. This is called the Bleimeister method. Lead is a good material for shot and bullets due to its density and its cheapness. In rifled weapons, the softness of lead is also beneficial because it helps grab into the rifling. For those who don't know what rifling is, it is a set of spiraling grooves that are in most modern pistols and rifles. The rifling causes the bullet to spin, which helps with its stability. There have been calls for lead to be removed from ammunition used in hunting and target shooting. On top of the concerns about lead building up in the ground, it has been found that while shooting, a significant amount of lead dust is expelled into the air. At minimum, better ventilation should probably be required at indoor ranges. There is a study on it below. During the Industrial Revolution and into modern day, lead found many new uses. Likely the most damaging use for lead was its addition to gasoline. In the 1920s, a team of General Motors engineers revealed that adding tetraethyl lead could prevent engine knock. Engine knock happens when some of the gas that was squirted into the engine cylinder does not ignite at the same time as the fuel that was ignited by the spark plug. That can cause a second explosion in the cylinder at the wrong time, which can cause damage to the engine. The octane rating you see on the gas pump relates to how likely the fuel is to cause knocking. The higher the number, the less likely to knock. Tetraethyl lead increased this rating and was one of the first octane boosters. The factories that made tetraethyl lead had a high rate of death and of the workers basically going crazy. Around 300 workers from the three plants were committed to mental institutions. This use was one of the main causes of lead contamination in the soil and water. Countries started phasing out tetraethyl the lead in the 1970s, and in 2021, Algeria became the last country to stop selling it for use in road cars. That does not mean it is completely gone, however. Avgas, which is the fuel used in piston airplanes, is still leaded. One of lead's biggest uses has to do with lead's high attenuation coefficient. This means that it is hard for many kinds of energy to pass through lead. Because of this, lead is often used for many different kinds of shielding. Many recording studios use lead sheets between layers of foam in their soundproofing setups. Lead is often used for radiation shielding in a variety of places ranging from nuclear reactors to the vests you see x-ray techs wear. These kinds of uses are probably some of the least likely to be replaced, since they are contained away from the public and hard to replace. A nuclear reactor is not a place for children. A lot of electrical cables around the world have a lead sheath that was extruded around them to protect them. It was used because it is easy to extrude a continuous lead sheath around the cabling to keep water out as well as give a little physical protection. This is starting to be phased out because of worries over the lead waste it creates when the cable is replaced and because the plastic alternatives are getting better and they are lighter. Lead solder is still fairly commonly used in electronics, although its use is starting to wane. Next we have by far the most common use in lead today, batteries. Lead acid batteries were the first kind of battery we created that could be recharged. The way a lead acid battery works is you start with a container of sulfuric acid. 
and one side of the container, you put some lead to act as an anode, also known as the negative side, that electrons will flow out of to a lead dioxide cathode on the other side of the acid container, known as the positive, where it then flows into the system it is connected to. During this process, the sulfur in the acid bonds with the lead and makes lead sulfate on the two plates. To have the battery make more power, just add more of these anode cathode pairs. Over time, this waters down the acid and makes the reaction within the battery less potent. However, you push current in the opposite direction, the lead and sulfur split up, recharging the battery. This is not a perfect process, though, and over time, some of the lead sulfate becomes a crystalline structure that no longer goes back to its previous state, leading the battery unable to charge. Compared to newer battery types like lithium and nickel metal hydride, lead acid batteries have a fairly short life cycle, often lasting for only about 200 charge cycles, where the others are capable of over a thousand. Lead acid batteries also have a tendency to just die for good if they are completely depleted. Lead acid batteries also have pretty poor energy density, and they are heavy since they are filled with lead and a liquid almost twice as heavy as water. Their two main advantages are that they are cheap and good at providing a surge current, which is when something electrical needs a lot of current for a short moment. This is why their most common usage is in internal combustion cars. The starter motor that kicks on when you turn the key in your ignition can draw a few thousand watts depending on what engine you have but only does so for a few seconds or preferably less. This usage also minimizes their life cycle issues because they only have to discharge to start the car and for things like lights and maintaining the computer memory when the engine is off. Once the engine is on, the alternator takes over and charges the battery and provides electricity where it is needed. Lead acid batteries are also sometimes used for power backups to keep lights and water pumps working in an emergency. They are also used in uninterruptible power supplies that you can buy to stop your computer from turning off immediately when the power goes out, so you have time to save the Ghost X Skeletor fanfiction that you have been working on. Lastly, lead often shows up in places it shouldn't. Be careful buying cheap no-name products such as plates and toys online because it is a fairly common occurrence that things like this could still have lead paint on them. Products in places like Wish and Temu are often made in factories that even the country they are in does not know about. If the price is too good to be true, it probably is. Be careful. That's all I have for you today. Socials, song list, and additional reading is in the description. Have a good day and eat something good.